Good evening and welcome to the 13th presentation of Avalanche Canada's 2021-2022 webinar series. My name is Sarah Taylor and I'm your, your producer for this evening. Alex Cooper is also online and he's your moderator, so he'll be looking out for your questions in the Q&A box. I hope you're all having a great season recreating in the backcountry. Avalanche Canada's mission is to help educate backcountry users so you can play safe in the mountains throughout the winter. We want you to know more, go further and come home. Firstly, we'd like to acknowledge that our session is being hosted on the territory of four nations, the Sinites, Chukwetmek, Tanaha, and Silks. As a national organization, we also acknowledge the many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit nations on whose land we live and recreate. Sorry, slide just got stuck there for a second. Uh, we'd also like to thank our sponsors. Uh, we're very grateful that our sponsors are loyal in their financial support for us during these challenging economic times and that they work with us to get new backcountry users involved in Avalanche Canada programming throughout the winter. We'd like to thank our government partners, our program partners, our sponsors and our contributors. This webinar is being presented by Outdoor Research. Outdoor Research is a supporter level sponsor and they have donated more than $10,000 to Avalanche Canada this season. So thanks Avalanche Canada, uh, thanks Outdoor Research for that. <laughs> it's not just the sponsors that keep Avalanche Canada doing what they're doing. Donations from the public are also important in supporting our programs. If you're in a position to donate and you'd like to help out, you can use the link that will be in the chat box to donate. Thank you. Before we get going, just a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, your mic will be muted and that's for everyone, but it, there are opportunities to ask a question. So if you'd like to do that, you can use the raise hand button in the bottom of your screen. You can also write a question in the Q&A box if you'd rather do that. Uh, but if you are going to type a question out, please make sure you put it in the Q&A box and not the chat box because we don't always spot them in there. You can also watch the chat box for resources and posted links. At the end of the session, we're going to have some door prizes to give away. So stick around to be in a chance in with a chance of winning one of those. So here's what you're all waiting for. Uh, tonight's presentation is the Spring Street Spring Ski Traverse planning and your dating process. Planning a traverse is a daunting task, and the devil is in the details. Our Yukon Field technician, Drew Nyland, is here tonight to break down the various components of planning, from the pre-trip plan with the intricacies of route planning, contingencies, gear, food and resources to the when what happens when you're actually out on the traverse. So looking at the weather, avalanche hazard, evaluating slopes and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> there are many variables to be sure and proper planning is essential. For the past eight years, Drew has taken on long and remote trips to the high Arctic where he's completed a number of month long ski traverses and base camps in Baffin Island. He really knows his stuff and we're excited for him to share his framework on planning these trips with you all tonight. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to Drew. Hello. Do you have me there, Sarah? I see you, yeah. Okay, great. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. Um, Sarah, I thought we'd just start with a poll um, that we could just put out to everyone just to see where everyone's at um, in their avalanche education. And while you send that out to everyone, I'm just gonna to try to get my presentation on the screen. So I'm gonna go here. Okie doke. Let's go back to the beginning. There we go. Can you see that? You're muted, Sarah. Okay, I'm just going to go ahead. Um, so thanks for the intro. Um, and thanks for everyone who came today. Um, I'm really excited about this. This is an uh, absolute uh, passion project for me. I love traverses, uh, long trips, remote places. Um, and when they asked me to do this, I just jumped at the opportunity. 
So without further ado, I'm just going to get right into it. So um, I kind of broke down the whole idea into two parts. So there's going to be the trip planning side and then the daily process side. And then the trip planning side, well, both sides, I'm going to break down once again to kind of their differences and the nuanced pieces between traverses and base camps um, for everyone. So elements of planning. And these are kind of like, let's start at the top. Let's start at the big, the big top of the pyramid here. What do we have to do? It's really where to go. Um, and that's a big topic for both traverses and base camps. And we'll, we'll break them down further in a moment. What to bring, it, it, becomes a, it becomes a really big question and it becomes a really dynamic answer when you start changing the kind of trips and places you're gonna go. And then most importantly, and especially for Avalanche Canada, it's how to do it safely. Uh, so those are kind of my, my three pillars of how I, how I come up with these ideas or plans or trips. So where to go can be a huge question. Let's start with base camps. So base camps, my, my, my golden piece of information for selecting a good place to have a base camp is a place that has a lot of options. So options include things like aspect, elevation bands, uh, terrain shape. And all of those things are, are really enabling you to have options. And that's what you want in these things. So if you're planning a base camp or a traverse, you're likely planning it either in the fall or midwinter. And so your understanding of what the conditions will be come spring, when you likely want to do these kinds of things, um, you, you're, not, you're not going to get a, a choice as much. Um, so you're going to have to deal with what the conditions are at that time. So a base camp, when you're setting something like this up, is really important to find a place where you can access multiple drainages potentially. Um, and, you know, think about those spring events, like when the valley bottoms completely melted out. So if you can set yourself up in kind of a higher elevation area that has access to multiple slopes safely, you're, you're going to be in a, in a much better place if, say, conditions aren't the best that year. You're still going to be able to have a great time. Access and egress is a huge part of both base camps and traverses, but traverses often you at least have the option of walking in. So access and egress for a base camp is likely, but not always, a helicopter. Um, ski planes can be used um, in more northern regions where there's no trees, you can potentially land a ski plane. Uh, snowmobiles are becoming super popular for these kinds of trips. So loading up a skimmer or a comatic um, and driving out to where you want to be with all of the all of the things that you need to set up for a week or more um, is becoming a lot more popular. And I, and I think that's really awesome because it's enabling so many more people to do these things. So on the flip side, traverses, um, often you can find a great traverse probably in a mountain range near you in a guidebook. Um, and that's often where people start. And guidebooks are really, really great. And then online resources play right into that, right? So they're going to give you a, a likely a bright red line on a map that tells you exactly where the traverse is. And it's going to break down pieces of, of the entire thing for you. Much like options, alternate routes are, are my kind of core piece of a good traverse. So alternate routes can mean that the bright red line on the map has you know, options where you can like go around entire features. Um, but alternate routes can be brought down to very, very, very small things as well. Like, uh, it, like areas you can walk out from. So places you can you can be on your route and then make a small deviation and make a complete exit, say, if something went wrong with your equipment. Um, but they can also be uh, being on a traverse and finding out that the southwest aspect is not very appealing, but maybe the south aspect is slightly more appealing. So ascents and descents that have a couple aspects to use in case conditions aren't amazing um, are going to give you are going to give you an easier time making good decisions out on a traverse. So what to bring uh, is a long list. This will not be an itemized or an exhaustive list of what to bring. 
but more ideas. So on base camps, what do you bring? You bring lots. That's the whole idea of the base camp is that you want to bring stuff that you're comfortable in because the entire environment will be new to you. It'll likely be places you don't normally uh, ski or ride. Um, it's going to be in, in, a, in a winter kind of environment. So you want to bring a lot. And my favorite things to bring are the camp and kitchen. So having a designated area to be inside in case weather comes in is really great if you're going to go the base camp route. Um, and, and, and that can be a, a tarp style shelter, but it can also be a, a full size standing tent really um, that you can make food in and hunker down in if weather's bad. And then my big pitch here is on a base camp, your ability to rescue is actually quite a bit higher because you're not limited in what you're carrying with you. So rescue equipment can be actually really robust. Your, your, your rescue pack um, can have a lot of first aid in it. It can have a, a sleeping bag, um, heat packs, extra food, all this kind of stuff that would make a potentially bad situation a lot easier for you, especially in a situation where you may have to wait to get picked up. So your rescue equipment in a base camp, I would argue is maybe you know up to a third of what you would take. Um, and then extra fuel and food in case of weather delays. So because just the nature of base camps are you're gonna be able to take more. So your extra fuel and food likely isn't just one day of extra fuel and food. It's probably like five days. Um, you can imagine talking to your friends or reading in guidebooks potentially or, or hearing from pro mountain professionals. Uh, people can get weathered in for quite some time in bigger ranges or remote places where the logistics just aren't working for the plane or a helicopter or the weather is not in your favor. So extra fuel and food when you're reliant on someone else to come get you becomes a really big deal. So that's another thing you want to be really robust in the base camp scenario. And there are always weather delays. Um, ask, ask people who have done them before, um, either going in or coming out, uh, there's some reason that the weather's altered their timing. So traverses, how do you do them? Well, it's, it's overarching message is that you get to take less. And with that, what you bring has to be quite carefully chosen. Um, I like to think on a base camp, you get to bring all of the bells and whistles. And on a traverse, you, you really have to have practiced how to use what you've brought because every single piece has a use, but it likely has multiple uses in ways that it interplays with the other equipment you brought. So a minimal camp and kitchen, you gotta be thinking that every day you're setting up camp and setting up a kitchen. So, you know, a simple, a simple trench in the snow for a bench and a little platform to cook on um, with a tarp over top of it is likely uh, what your kitchen will be. Um, and then your camp is, you know, taking time to understand A, how your tent or whatever your sleeping arrangement is works and knowing how to put it up quickly in the event of, of incoming weather or, or what have you um, are both really important. So that really plays into this idea I have about traverses where it's really more how much you've practiced with what you have, whereas a base camp, it's really how much you have. So with, yeah, without saying that again, exact amounts of fuel and food, plus a little more, 10 day trip, you bring 12 days of food and fuel, that'll make sense but having a really exact amount of everything, really measuring out how much you need as a person. It might be different than other, other folks on your trip. So knowing yourself and knowing how you're going to interact with the food you've brought. And then here's back to this idea of multi-use equipment. So multi-use rescue equipment that you're well practiced with. And when we're talking about rescue equipment here, we're talking about stuff that's outside of the stuff that we definitely have, which is like a beacon shovel probe um, first aid kit. This is the extraneous stuff. So how you're gonna move someone, um, how you would use a rope to get down a slope if someone was hurt, these kinds of scenarios that you play out in your head. Those are the rescue, that's the rescue equipment we're talking about here. 
And then how to do it safely, the great question. Um, in base camps, there, there's a whole system in the base camp scenario where you get more information the longer you're there. So the first day you're there, it's probably a brand new place to you, brand new aspects, um, brand new snowpack potentially. And so you're gonna invest a lot of time, right? When you get there to figure out what's going on. That's, that's really important. That's a really big part of the first part of a base camp is to build that idea of what you think is going on and how you think it's changing or, or not changing. I, I would recommend in these kinds of scenarios is having a weather plot and a weather plot in my work as an avalanche technician is a, is a specific place with instruments. Um, but your weather plot could be something as simple as um, <clears throat> a flat surface outside that you know is protected from the wind. And every day you measure how much snow is falling there. And so it's a regular measurement. Um, you have a thermometer hung in the shade and it's a regular measurement. You know that it's gonna be accurate in comparison to its previous measurements. Um, so you get to develop that, like I was saying, you get to develop that picture over time, but you also get to develop these kinds of um, networks of information gathering. And the daily process, which we're gonna get into right after this, is much more akin to a hut-based trip, which I know are becoming really popular and that's awesome as these like, this, this gateway into staying out in the backcountry that huts are, whether it's a backcountry ski touring hut or if it's um, uh, just a, a, like a warden style hut or ACC park hut um, where you're doing all of the, the maintenance and whatever, um, the, the daily process of a base camp will be remarkably similar to that if that's the background you're coming from. So they can be a nice entry into, into this whole world of winter camping and, and, and being out for extended periods of time. Traverses, how to do them safely. So the, you're, you're kind of stuck on a traverse. This is kind of the, you don't have a lot to play with on a traverse and it's often why traverses are done in the spring um, because the spring offers its own um, hazard mitigations in that often and likely there's parts of the day where the ground, the snow surface is so frozen, it'd be very hard to break through. Um, it's very poor travel conditions likely but that's really what you're using to mitigate the fact that you kind of have to go up and down what you've chosen to go up and down months before. So they require quite a bit of timing um, and you ought to respect that you're, you're, you're stuck doing, in some cases you're stuck doing um, what you've planned to do. And that's why having those alternates is so important. Um, so to manage those hazards um, in the spring, we really use the time of day, like I was talking about with the refrozen snow surface. That's a huge part of spring. Um, not all traverses are done in the spring, but that's a big reason people tend that direction. Um, managing terrain in macro and micro. So, um, you know, is this big piece of terrain somewhere I want to be? Yes or no. And then if it's a yes, how do I get through there in the safest possible way? And those are some like really big kind of uh, think, big thinking kind of questions that take a lot of experience and time to get to, but you can start thinking about that on maybe a smaller traverse or potentially like a hut to hut base trip um, where you're gonna have extra information all the time. And then the daily process, which we're about to do, is much more akin to a day trip in a brand new region. So you're likely coming over ridges and into valleys and new drainages and into valleys and new drainages over and over and over again. So the snowpack may be similar in each of them, but every day you're probably doing a, a, a very robust daily plan and process to make sure that what you thought was going on in that valley is in fact correct moving into the next one. So the daily process. So now that we've got like our ideas about how these things might work or what they might look like, how do we actually implement those things? And that's actually a really, it's a, it's a big question, but luckily that we, we at Avalanche Canada have some infrastructure for this. 
This is what we call the daily process. And if you haven't seen this before, this is my pitch. So, and maybe Sarah or Alex can put it in the chat box, but um, you can go to avisavvy.com and you can read about the daily process. And this is our version of the daily process. This is how we do it. Um, there's many ways to do it, but this is how we do it. And the daily process they talk about in Avi Savvy, which is this online educational tool we have at Avalanche Canada um, that's free to everybody. It's, it's really set up and the wording is really about you have the internet, you're at home, you leave in your car, you go ski that day, you come back, you debrief with your friends and you do the whole thing the next day again. Well, on traverses and base camps, we, we can't quite do it that way. So we have to do the low tech version. Um, and this requires some maybe kind of more old school versions of these things, but it also can you, you know use some like up and coming technologies to make it more similar to a day process at home, but can also just offer us more and better information. So step one on the daily process is get the forecast. Easy enough, hey? Especially when you're at home, you go to avalanche.ca, there it is, tell you what's going on. But how do we get it if we don't have the internet? Well, there's a really easy answer. It could be um, satellite communication. So you could use one of many products that are coming out that I'm really happy to see are, are, are having the price and cost of entry into those things come down. Um, if you're somewhere down south that isn't up in the Yukon or up further north, um, you may even have cell service from ridge tops um, in some places. So those are all options as well. But satellite communications could give you the forecast, an abridged forecast likely, um, wherever you are. Having said that, there's of course places that don't have a forecast that definitely have mountains. So you could be in a place that doesn't have an avalanche forecast. Um, so sometimes you've got to be your own forecaster a little bit. Um, I would still recommend getting communications if you've got one of these devices from a trusted person who's capable of reading the forecast, both avalanche and weather, and able to give you information. Um, but there's other things you can use as well. And these are maybe the, maybe the, older, the older skills um, that people maybe don't practice as much since these age of communication, but the barometer, if you have a barometer watch or if you just have a barometer, uh, it can give you a lot of great information. Uh, I, I am very much myself a student of these things as much as a professional. Um, and I still learn every day how pressure change alters the incoming weather um, and how to read that. Um, it's really intricate. I, I really recommend diving into it and learning more, um, but it's a really great tool. If you see the barometer crashing, so if you see the numbers descending, you're likely thinking that there's a low pressure coming, which implies poor weather. Sky condition, uh, you know, these, these notions of which cardinal direction you're looking and what it looks like there. So in Western Canada, um, our prevailing weather kind of comes out of the west southwest. So if you're looking to the west, if you know which way west is and you're looking to the west and it looks stormy, you know, you're, you're getting those inputs. You're, 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 and as you're out on these trips, I think you'll find much like I think I've found on these trips, that you become very in tune with which direction that weather is and if you think it's coming towards you. Wind direction can be a big one. Is the wind coming the way the wind always comes? Something I, I use in the spring, especially if it's somewhere I've not been so much, is when you look at the snow, you can often kind of see what side has been quite wind blown. It's been stripped away. There's no more snow on one side. And the other side looks really fat and pillowy. That's the prominent wind direction. That's the way the wind normally blows. It's moved the snow that way. So if, I, if the wind is coming from that direction, it might be windy. But if the wind is coming from the opposite direction, I might start thinking that that's um, telling me a storm is on the way, telling me that weather is changing. And it's not changing in a way where it's going to slowly ramp up. It may, may be changing in a pretty a drastic way kind of in the near future. Temperatures and trend, they all play together, of course, right? If you see a big crash or a big spike in temperature, you're gonna start thinking about how that's 
affecting the weather. And then of course, when you're doing your own avalanche forecast out of the weather, you're gonna start thinking about how that's affecting the snow. And so this is, this is the, the weather becoming the avalanche forecast. So if you had a sense of what the hazard was when you went out and what the problems were in the snow, and, and that was the day you started, and now you're in tomorrow, yesterday, your assessment since yesterday, plus the overnight change, is what you're expecting the forecast to be moving forward. So that gives you kind of a framework to take the, the weather you're seeing and add it to the forecast you may have left home with. So in places that you don't have a forecast, we have this awesome tool at Avalanche Canada, we call it the Dangerator. Um, and if you haven't seen this thing before, which I admittedly, when I first started working outside in avalanche terrain, this I, I hadn't seen. And when I did see this, it completely blew my mind. It's such a simple flow chart about avalanche hazard. If you, if you haven't seen this before at avalanche.ca, it's at abbysavvy.com. You can screenshot my screen right now. I really recommend letting this thing sink in. It's really great. It does have some drawbacks and one of its big drawbacks are is it's not perfect in the spring. So the spring has some added little nuances that make this not exactly perfect. But if you're coming from a place in an AST1 or before that, but you're very literate of the forecast, you, you read the forecast, you know what the danger is when you're going out, the hazard, the problems, you're really into it. This is a way to take what you're seeing out there and, and give it those, those thresholds that we use when we make the forecast. So I highly recommend the Dangerator. It does have its weaknesses in the spring, but if you haven't seen this before, I recommend giving this one some thought. Okay, so the next thing on the, the daily process wheel is planning your trip. So of course, if I, I didn't say this at the beginning, but the daily process happens once for your whole trip, but then it happens every day as well. So you got your big overarching stuff that we talked about at the beginning. That was your trip plan over the whole thing. But each day is going to break down into its own. They're their own little trips that link up to make one long trip. So plan your trip. Otherwise, you'll end up walking through a creek. So where on the trip are you? And this seems really easy. Well, it should be easy if you're at a base camp. But if you're on a traverse, this might not be as obvious as it seems. So really pinpointing where you are. If you're a GPS person, use a GPS. Use probably two, you know, confirm with someone else where you are and then identify the local features around you. So you know where you are on the dot on your phone and you know where you are in relation to the things in your immediate vicinity. And that becomes really important because when you're making a trip plan, you need to come up with where you are and where you're trying to get to. So what is the day end goal? And I think it, there'll be a thread that I'll pull through this whole thing here. And it'll really be about um, interpersonal communication on these kinds of trips. Having a day end goal that's stated at the beginning of the day helps everyone. Even if it's not where you wanted to go that day, you thought you, th you, you were super strong. You thought we could have made it way further. But having that discussion at the beginning of the day is gonna let everyone pace themselves, set up their energy reserves in a way um, where they can be a happy person on that trip. Um, and it's also gonna help you have a really concise safety talk in a situation where you're not already standing under the thing you, you may not wanna be under. So it gives you a chance to bring those things up in the safety of your, your tent or your tarp or whatever it is. So planning your trips, base camps versus traverses, I touched on this a little bit. In a base camp, it's gonna be much like a hut trip where you're going to this aspect today and coming back. How long is it gonna take us to get there? How will that interact with the warming in the day? It's a big thing in the spring. And on a traverse, it's gonna be much more about how do we get, how do we make the progress we need to get out when we need to get out. 
So I thought I'd just fire up. I, I, I don't have a, a drawn out template, mostly because I don't use a template for a trip plan, but I thought I'd just offer everyone um, on here some really quick, some really quick number values. I use these, they're not perfect. They don't work with everyone and they don't work for every trip, but they sure give you a good starting point. If you're going out with people you don't really know, um, or maybe you know them really well, but you don't really know their fitness levels. Um, these numbers can give you a really great starting point. So when you're at home, you've got your map on your table, everyone's sitting around and you're trying to draw your red line on the map on where you're gonna go. Um, distance, so walking, ski touring, um, you, can, you often ski around like three to five kilometers an hour. If it's a whiteout or really heinous travel, you could probably dial it back to one kilometer an hour. Um, elevation gain, so for all the, every 300 meters, add an hour to that day plan. Um, only going up, of course, you go a lot faster on the way down, <laughs> hopefully. Um, breaks are really important to put in there. Um, they should be in there. Your, these calculations are going to be wrong if they're not in there. And my breaks calculations I usually do are kind of two 15 minute breaks, one 45 minute break. Whether we do all of them or not, that hour 15 seems to magically vanish um, even if we don't take formal breaks. Um, so I would add those in and just into your day plan and then transitions are an extra 15 minutes. Anytime you need to switch from say uphill to downhill, uh, glacier to non-glacier, uh, whiteout to blue sky, whatever transition, just throw 15 minutes in for that. And that'll give you a general idea of how long it's gonna take to travel around. Um, there's one big thing missing here, of course, and that's downhill travel. Um, downhill travel is potentially very fast. Uh, and it often, I find at least, can get absorbed into the margins of these numbers. So I would just add those in um, only calculating uphill with uh, just a best guess for downhill travel times uh, with the skill of you and your group. So moving right along in the daily process wheel, we have check your gear. Your car is gonna do this at the beginning of your trip. I don't think I've been on a tra traverse or a base camp where I haven't had to fix a stove. If you've not fixed one of these stoves before and these are the kind you use, I highly recommend um, getting the repair kit and knowing how to use it. Um, so checking your gear includes, is everything still working? I can't count how many times something's broken, no one said anything about it because it still functions in its intended way, only to find out a week later that that small broken thing has turned into a catastrophically broken thing. Um, this can be, you know, your, your skis, your boots, your board, your poles, your stove, your bowl, anything. Um, so really keeping a tab on if something's broken, anything. And then this is a more important one and becomes a really big part of, of your decision making. And it'll likely be part of your like morning discussion you have with everyone. Has any critical piece of equipment been compromised? Are we, did, did we puncture a hole in the fuel bottle? Um, is, you know, are our skins not working? Uh, you know, are they just getting so glommed up? Have we lost our ski? Has something gone missing? You know, these kinds of things. And then that's when you're gonna pull out your contingency plans, your plan Bs, your alternate routes, your different egresses from your base camp and be like, we need to plan for that now, as soon as it's identified. As soon as there's a problem, you wanna try to fix it because they're gonna snowball and they're gonna potentially become pretty bad if you're far away. So quantity of consumables remaining. Um, so how much you have of everything left, this is like food and fuel really. Um, and I wouldn't, I maybe used to do a lot more of like, a, oh, I added it all up before we left. I don't need to keep track of this anymore. Um, but what I've learned is that there's, there mad, there's magical camp fairies that take away bits of food and little bits of fuel that you didn't really put into your mind. And then all of a sudden day 10 of a 10 day trip and uh oh, you're out of, you're out of snacks um, and you didn't see it coming and you didn't have a chance to fix it beforehand. 
So keeping a really good tally of those of those things that you're going to use up as the trip goes on. Of course, coffee is in there as well. Um, so the next big one, and we're really kind of transitioning now out of like the nuts and bolts of making these trips happen and into the snowpack safety stuff. And that's an important thing to know because it's really easy in my experience to invest a lot of time in the nuts and bolts part uh, because they're really tactile and you can feel them. If, they're, if you're hungry, you're hungry, you know. Um, but if you don't invest all the time into the snow condition stuff, or the safety stuff, uh, you may not know until you're in a bad situation. So I'd really emphasize that when you see the daily process wheel is really giving each section its, its, its due amount of time and giving the, the snow safety stuff, you know, have that morning discussion um, where you and your group are verifying conditions among yourself um, or among your group. I really give that the time it deserves, even if you're feeling rushed to get up to where you're going. So reviewing what you think is going on and verbalizing it, really practicing those skills of talking it out, saying what you think is going on and having your reasons and understanding that someone else may see the exact same thing and see it really differently. Um, and really respecting that among your group. I think that I think we're learning as an industry and as recreators that, um, that communication piece is super important. So practice those skills. Um, really, really work on explaining yourself and why you think it's either good to go or, or not, not the day for it. So things you might want to think about that are more travel conditions as well as snow conditions, they all come into safety in their own right. Um, is it ski cramp on country? Do you need to be thinking about sliding away um, because the surface is so firm? Poor visibility, that can be huge. That can be the biggest deterrent of forward travel, um, far more than objective hazard that you can maybe slip your way through if you really try or take an alternate route. If you can't see where you're going, you can't even make those decisions. So poor visibility can be a huge, huge factor. Keeping an eye on the weak layers. Now we're really into like the snow stuff, right? So persistent weak layers. So this will be any layer in the snowpack that you're concerned may, may have, a, have the chance of causing, uh, being, the, being the cause of an avalanche, right? Um, or may get woken up by, uh, by future inputs. So really keeping an eye on them, especially in the traverse context where you may be going from valley to valley, um, drainage to drainage, or potentially over you know, whole mountain ranges. People do really amazing trips. So keeping an eye on persistent weak layers. The refreeze. Um, <clears throat> the refreeze could be its whole own webinar. And I'll pitch my own webinar later this month. At the end of the month, I think I'm going to do a whole thing about um, spring conditions and how nuanced and finicky they can be. But the refreeze is a really important part of it. It's the surface snow, how much it refroze after it warmed up and how much it refroze can be measured in a lot of different ways. You know, how thick the freeze is, how hard it is, how supportive it is. Um, and you can measure it in certain ways with a thermometer to know if it's, um, did it freeze for a really long time or maybe it's been melting now for a couple of days without refreezing and how does that affect your, your plan? So there's quite a bit that goes into that like spring um, version of all of these, but really respecting the refreeze. And if it's not there, it's just not there. So you need to, you need to have a different plan if the refreeze doesn't happen overnight. This is a great one. I hear my coworker James um, say this one, or I, I, it's, maybe he only said it once, but it's really stuck with me. Um, seeking out that information that disproves what you believe. So at any chance you get, take the opportunity to look for that thing that you don't believe is there or look for that problem that um, you've kind of put out of your mind. That's not really a problem anymore. But if it were still a problem, it would be right here. So maybe I'll look for it. Maybe I'll, you know, looking for cornices or wind effect or whatever it is that you're, you're not concerned with that day, you ruled out 
as a problem. Just really seek out that information that may prove you wrong rather than constantly reinforcing your own ideas. And then overnight changes, that could be really big, right? Um, whatever it is you do to, to make sure that you capture what happens overnight in some way, um, whether it be, you know, you have a bit of a morning discussion. Did anyone hear their tent flap in the night? Do we think there was wind overnight? Um, carrying a little something, putting a little something outside that if it snows overnight, you can kind of get a sense of how much snow fell with some kind of measurement or some kind of standard that you're measuring it. You know, it's this, it's up to my buckles on my boot or it's um, up to the pant cuff on my leg or something like that, that you know is a, is a threshold for you. So this is, this is, I mean, all of these safety ones, I, it could be their own, their own whole hours long, course long, week long, month long um, tutorial on these things. Um, but using good travel habits is, is huge. Um, and I would really like to emphasize that it's not using good travel skill. It's a habit. It's something that you practice on days when it's easy. Uh, you don't just hammer up the center because you know it's the, there's no problem there. Um, you really practice those habits. So it's kind of second nature and you can use, you know, more of your brain for thinking about other things going on and your your traveling is, is something that's really a well-practiced skill. Of course, there's a long list of travel habits and good ones um, range in their efficacy of being good, um, depending on the time of year, the mountain range, all kinds of things, but some that I like. Um, and there's a great list, like I said, on Avi Savvy um, of what these look like um, in a general context. These are maybe a couple of little more specific ones. Um, Good travel habits, I mean, one at a time is a great one. If you can limit the amount of people, assuming that you're not in this huge piece of terrain where you're gonna lose sight of everybody and it's gonna be a, a lost cause, you know, everyone's gonna disperse one at a time, you know, spread it out, give yourself space. So if something does go wrong, you've got as a group time to react. Good communication, not just a travel habit, but it, a golden rule of long trips um, in the backcountry, or long trips with the same people or travel in general. I, I can't stress how much good communication will make your trip, be it base camp or traverse or hut trip, um, a better time um, if everyone's doing the same thing with the same plan. So good communication is huge. And, it's, and it, is a, it, it is a good travel habit. In this context, I think when I made this, I was thinking about like being able to communicate over distance. We often use, and I know it's becoming more popular as a recreationist to use radios. I love radios. I would carry one everywhere. If, you, if your group is not carrying radios, which on a long traverse may be an easy cut for weight. Um, having hand signals, you know, what, is, what does this mean? Does it mean, you know, you know, what does that mean to you and, and what should the person seeing that do? That's really the, the part of the communication you need to know. Um, have a really good method of calling over distance. Um, some, uh, some good friends, you know, they wear a whistle on their zipper tab. I love that. I can whistle with my fingers. So I, 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 I stick to that one for long range communication, but having some way to get someone's attention a long ways away, highly recommend. Travel on high ground. So if the avalanche is gonna run through the lowest po possible ground as a, as a really large spring avalanche may, um, you, you know, if you were to imagine pouring water over the slope, where would the water go and what would be the high spots? And using those, not explicitly, because there's other reasons potentially to stay off high ground, but as a general rule, if you can kind of stay up on high ground, the better. Group up in safe spots. Often easier said than done. First, you must identify the safe spots and confirm with your group that it's a safe spot. Um, and then to group up in them is this notion of, you're, you're not gonna be able to on-site the whole thing, likely. So go until you get to a safe spot, know where that safe spot is and have communicated that with the group so everyone knows that you're trying to get to a certain spot and that's where you'll group up. Respect the corn cycle. So the corn cycles back in this refreeze kind of idea. Um, good travel habits include giving it 
its due respect. And that is that if the refreeze happens and travel is difficult and on top, and you're staying on top with your skis or board, you can travel in different kinds of terrain and likely steeper terrain um, than you can if it's already breaking down and it's already becoming corn snow, this, this kind of wet, wetter snow on top with a supportive base underneath of it. So you really wanna give the corn cycle um, its due respect in the spring. This, this idea is a, is a, is a really popular uh, mountain travel technique and it's travel from safe spot to safe spot. So like I was saying, if you're gonna group up down there in a safe spot, you could potentially add these into your route plan of where your safe spots are that day. And you're gonna travel concisely point to point, connect the dots. Um, and that's gonna give you a sense of, of objective safety in the group. And then you're just gonna to have to make decisions to get to that next one. If you can't make it to the next one, know that you will have to go back of course. And will that still be safe? Say it's warming up or the wind is now blowing. So keeping that in mind as well in the safe spot to safe spot travel. This is another one of my coworkers once, uh, James, that I that I completely love is link up small pieces of low consequence terrain um, up here in the Yukon, in the White Pass. This is our this is our mantra. I this should be written on our whiteboard at work, um, and it's how we and it's how we get around um, because. Because it's, because it's a really good travel habit. If you can stay in small terrain, terrain that doesn't have big overhead, uh, terrain that's not super connected to the things around it, and you can link them up um, in areas where there may not be consequence below them, so like a big cliff or a terrain trap, um, you're gonna be in pretty good shape most of the time. Um, there are of course places where this doesn't work. These aren't golden rules that always work, but they're good habits to have. And then this one, I can't stress enough as well, is that when you're tired, when you're on these trips and you're starting to feel like a robot, just really crushing it up a hill that you didn't really feel like walking up that morning at four in the morning um, to get there before the sun, um, good travel habits are gonna be your friend. And as I said before, habits get learned on easy days um, with, people you know well in simple, in simple situations. And that's not necessarily where they save you, um, but that is where you learn them. So if you're practicing them in easy, on easy days and day trips and easy terrain and familiar places, they're gonna start feeling like second nature when you're standing on top of something that you may not necessarily be able to see where you wanna go. It's gonna feel more obvious to you. And I, re I really recommend that. So evaluate slopes. Um, like, like I said, all of these are, are such good points. And if you're doing the educational stuff online on Avi Savvy, or you're in your AST one or two or your professional courses, these will keep coming up. This is the, the long-term skill development. And so knowing how to do these things is, is something that you'll just continue progressing on for years and years and years. So where can you start? You can start with the evaluator. Um, if you're fresh out of your AST1, you've seen this thing before. Um, and I could hammer home the evaluator. It's available at avalanche.ca and Avi Savvy. Go take a look at it. And like I said, much like the dangerator, if you're really switched on in this framework, you live somewhere where there is a forecast, um, this is gonna be a great way to test your feeling about what you should do in X piece of terrain with how it would fit in a matrix of hazards. So it's really great and it helps you calibrate really um, where you are um, without having necessarily like direct mentorship or direct, um, I, I highly recommend seeking out direct mentorship, but in its stead, these things can help you calibrate yourself to make sure you're in line with what's gonna make sense. So, on top of the evaluator, there's all kinds of other stuff you can do to evaluate slopes. And once again, a, not an exhaustive list, but, but a great start. Um, how big is the slope? Um, in the spring specifically, I think about full-size full avalanches. 
So a, a full-size avalanche, be maybe an avalanche that's removing all of the snow you can see. It's taking all of it. Because at some point in the spring, that's going to happen. Yeah, I'm hoping that it won't be the, the day you are in that even drainage. You don't want to you don't want to cut those margins that close. But knowing that is going to give you some kind of perspective on on what's the maximum thing that could come out of here. What else is going to help you develop that picture in your head is how deep the snow is. If there's 10 centimeters of snow on a gigantic slope, the avalanche it could produce is quite large, but it's much smaller than if there's three meters of snow on that slope. Both are going to be a really, really bad day, but they're going to alter how you interact with it potentially. So at and in a safe spot, because you've been on your whole trip going safe spot to safe spot, you can get together with your group and talk about, you know, just like you would on Google Earth, if you're one of these Google Earth people like I am, or you're a fat map person, whatever it is, going around with your group and in real time looking at the slope and being like, what are the points of concern here? Just having a real analog moment, you know? Um, it's really putting it all out there. I'm worried about the wind. I think the wind is doing this. I'm worried about those rocks there. They look thin. And I know from my avalanche education that thick to thin places can be a trigger point for avalanches. And really just throwing it all out there with your group. This helps everyone stay together on why you're doing something. And it offers people that maybe have really great observations, but don't feel confident enough to extrapolate them into why or why not they want to go there. They can just say their part and people with more experience can use those observations to help the whole group build a picture and make it through the slope safely. So these are some of the things, you know, you could, you could bring up in a, what are the points of concern? Cornices, of course, are a big deal in the spring, something you want to give a lot of, a, a lot of respect and a lot of distance. Um, how do you evaluate the slope? What time of day it is and where is the sun? So what time of day it is is relative to the ambient heat. So is it warm? Um, and, then, and then also the time of day might be how far along that slope do you plan on getting before dark, before it's hot, before it freezes again and we can't ski down the other side. Um, so those are some things to think about. And then of course, where is the sun? Is this slope getting cooked? Is it bright blue skies? And, the sun is just really getting into the snow here. Um, those are things to think about on given slopes. Or is it a little shady dip? You know, it might be a little different. What is the temperature? So if you're a new to avalanche, um, the avalanche world, if you're a recreator um, and you're just new to the whole thing, this is this is my this is me reaching out to you that knowing the temperature is super important, especially in the spring. And so I would suggest going out and buying a thermometer. I think it might be one of the better things you can have with you uh, on any given day um, to help you make a really good decision about avalanches. So when the temperature approaches zero, you wanna start thinking that the snow is changing right now it's ice crystals and it's, they're melting. So things are changing and not in a drastic way, like when there's a lot of new snow falling and we all know that there's an input. The wind is howling, you know, but if it's minus four or minus 10 even, and you're trudging uphill with a giant pack on, it might feel like it's really warm out. You might be in a t-shirt, but it's, but it's not. And it's really hard because you're producing heat. It's really hard to know, it could be minus, one, it could be plus one, you're blowing and you feel so cold, you got sweaty on the way up and you're not, you're not picking it up. So getting a thermometer, if you're gonna take the air temperature, make sure you shade the thermometer and give it some time to tell you what the actual temperature is. But that's my pitch. Buy a thermometer, practice using it and try to calibrate yourself on what the temperature is, what the air temperature is. And then back to my refreeze, like I said, there'll be a spring webinar um, at the end of the month where I'll talk a lot about the spring and I will say the word refreeze 100 more times, so I'll stop.
I'll stop saying it in this one. Okay, so we are we are getting near the end. I promise I'll stop talking soon. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer those. But the last one, and brings you into your next day, really, is reflect on your day. Having a, a morning plan is super important for your day to happen. And I think a lot of people, I want to believe a lot of people do that. You're driving out to go skiing. You're talking about the day. Where are we going to go? How are we going to get there? Is it going to be good? What skis should I bring? What board should I ride? You're talking about it. The end of the day, I feel, is often very truncated. You're trying to get home. You're trying to get food. <laughs> you're trying to change pace. You're trying to do your apres, whatever it is. On trips, it's often similar. You're trying to set up camp. You're trying to do all these things. It's a really important part of the daily process. Here's me and my dog reflecting on our day. Um, some great questions to lead the conversation. You don't have to lead it, but you can have a set of questions that you just like, takes five minutes, hammer it out with everyone. And I, I think everyone would be impressed at how much they get out of that, how much they learn from their day, how much they hear about someone else's uncertainty in a, in a similar place they had uncertainty and how that turns into a lesson without it costing you anything, how those free lessons get learned. So what was the point in the day we were at most risk? Great question. Uh, it doesn't have to be avalanche related. It doesn't even have to be mountain related. Maybe you dropped your tent in the creek on the way up or something. And now everyone's cold because the tent's wet. You know, it can be anything. It can be the drive to the skiing. Um, but it's important to recognize that risk comes in all kinds of different flavors in the mountain environment, in the winter mountain environment. Um, it comes from everywhere. So identify, pointing them out to everyone to make sure that everyone knows where they are for future times, especially when you're learning. This is a really good one. What was the point in the day we had the most uncertainty? That one might not ring as easily as most risk. Most risk is like, yeah, I felt scared there. That made sense to me. Um, but uncertainty can be a harder one to put your finger on sometimes. So the point in the day you had the most uncertainty um, could be you were on a slope and you thought something was happening. You were really, comp you felt confident in your assessment of what was going on. Um, and then an adjacent slope to you avalanched and you have no explanation for that. That could be a point in the day you had uncertainty. That's a really obvious one or in reflection, you had uncertainty. Um, places that might not be so obvious are uh, you walked up over a ridge and you came to the other side and everything went perfect but you realized you skipped the point to yeah you know you regrouping in safe spots you were just in a you were in the zone you were out front you put the track in you made it to the top everyone came up behind you tired and sweaty because you were moving so fast you were way out there and you realized that you actually had huge uncertainty you had no reason to do that other than it was in in your kind of mechanical flow so those are great points to reflect on. This is one that is an action item and action items in these reflection processes are awesome because there's something you can like put your finger directly on. What information would make this easier? What just gen, if we had a perfect forecast, avalanche forecasting would be easier. I know that. Um, and, but that's kind of a harder one. So what information, you know, if we knew that it was minus three out and not minus two or not zero, we would feel better. So maybe we should go buy a thermometer. Just an example. Um, so that's one a question that I really like. Then of course its counterpart is how do we get it? We go buy the thermometer. Um, we get better computers to make better weather models for better avalanche. There, there's different things you can do to get that information over the course of your trip. Maybe your, your uncertainty comes from not having a lot of snow observations. The information that would make it easier would be knowing if there were persistent weak layers and how do we get that information is every night when we stop, we dig a, a small profile just to identify what's in the snow. It might take five minutes. 
Or maybe everyone calls out the layers they see in the snow when they're digging camp in. Hey, did you see this? The top 10 centimeters is really hard. That could be a way to get the information in a really simple way that would make your decisions easier, that are your uncertainty, and you start like fixing problems as you're reflecting on them. Then of course, how does everyone feel? This is now my, the, probably the 10th time I brought up communication, but not just asking people how they feel, but assessing it. Um, you, uh, I, there's, there's really great language for doing it properly, but the, the idea being, um, you know, that person looked really tired today. They were quite slow. They were far behind. They looked very sunburned. Um, how you communicate that to people is a big part of the communication piece, but that check in with everyone. It's a team event out there. Uh, there's no one person that's going to drag everyone along on this. And I think the notion that you can do that um, is prevalent in some people and, and that's fine. And, and maybe they can do that in some cases, but the whole event is gonna be easier. Your entire safety network is gonna be stronger and more robust if everyone can be involved. So making sure everyone feels good is, is a huge part of the puzzle. And then of course, where should we go next year? Um, that's kind of it. Um, thank you so much for listening to my musings about um, traverses and planning and the daily process. There's all kinds of great resources out there. And I recommend if you want to get into this kind of thing to go for it. It's super amazing. So get out there, learn more, um, get a guidebook, um, get involved with people that are doing these kinds of things, um, whether it's a guiding operation or a, a strong friend group and, and, really, and really get out there. I've, I've found them extremely meaningful to me and I'll, I hopefully will continue doing them for years to come. Hey, thanks so much, Drew. Are you, are you done? Yeah, that's- Ready for uh, questions? I'm ready for questions. Great, we had a couple come up. Uh, during your presentation, um, yeah, it was really great. So lots of good information. But um, yeah, Mel Mercier asked um, asked a bit a bit ago about regarding the danger radar. She was wondering if you could expand on why the danger radar has weaknesses in the spring. Right. So watch this. Am I? You guys can still see all this. I'm just going to flip yeah. back to the danger radar. I have to go through a lot of slides here. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so there it was. The danger radar. So some of the things that are not included here, or maybe, how do I explain this best, are not granular enough. So they're not, is there critical loading? So in your, if you're in your first step, you're, you start with considerable, you move into step one, critical loading or critical warming. So critical warming, how are you assessing the critical warming potentially? Um, could be maybe like a, a maybe a just a bit higher level um, thinking process that might not fall into the danger rater perfectly. So critical warming is like near zero potentially. In the spring, on steep and south facing things, and if you live further north, um, those south aspects can actually expand far to the east and west. Um, they can get input from the sun that will not only quickly jump the, the danger into high, um, but it may not be really apparent until it's really started breaking down. Another thing it doesn't account for um, that I, if, if I didn't say it enough in the presentation, I'll say it again here, is how strong the refreeze was from yesterday. So just two seconds about that, I promise I won't ramble forever, Alex, but, um, if you've had a huge avalanche event, it was really warm for a long time and the sun and the heat got deep into the snow and then all of a sudden it snapped cold and everything just froze up super strong. You probably wouldn't be in that high avalanche hazard once the sun came back out that you might think from the day before if you just followed along on the danger radar. So in the spring, our drivers are really that heat and the sun 
and how cold it got overnight and how thick that crust is. Those become our real big drivers. And without those captured really well in the dangerator, I would hesitate to arm you only with the dangerator and to have you go out in the spring to realize that there's a couple more things going on there that, that won't get captured properly in this. Right, thanks, Drew. Yeah, and I should mention um, Avalanche Canada has a page. We've got a page on our website about spring conditions, which talks about the four different kinds of conditions you can encounter in the spring. So I'll share a link to that in the chat um, so people can follow up on that. Uh, yeah, and there's, thanks, Alex. Uh, yeah, no problem. Uh, next question was uh, from Jennifer Joyce, and she just wanted to know if you had any recommendations for uh, thermometers. Uh, I don't know. What do I even use? Um, I, I personally have like one of these armored, uh, like alcohol ones. I think they sell them at Mountain Equipment Co-op um, uh, that I carry always, that I like always have. Um, and then for work um, or for having a second thermometer, I have a digital one. So you can get these little ones. They look like meat thermometers. Alex, you can help me out if there's a brand you can think oh, of, but I- I don't know, I, thermometers. Yeah, it, they're like, they're about yay big. They've got a, a metal anode on, or a probe on them. And they've got a little head that reads out the thermometer. I think Backcountry Access makes them. Yeah. A, a number of companies do, but I often carry one that isn't supported by batteries um, because I'm, I'm bad for battery. <laughs> Yeah, no doubt, especially they <laughs> need those little tiny batteries, which can be right. uh, very easy to lose if you're not careful. Um, yeah, uh, Pular Elise asked if you could uh, elaborate a bit more on the corn cycle. Uh, yeah, I can, I can give you another two minutes on corn cycle. There, uh, what, what was the name of the person? If they could uh, please show up to the webinar that I'm doing at the end of the month about spring conditions, perfect. And the corn cycle is, so what I'm talking about there is you've got a warm snowpack, it freezes up hard overnight. The next day, the, the sun, so this is, your, this is your snow, the sun's out here, and the sun starts impacting the surface of the snow and melting it. The, the rest of the snow is protected by the crust below. But as the sun continues, it melts through that crust. And there's kind of a magic moment if you're from the Rockies or one of these places where spring skiing is the, the end all be all. Um, there's a moment where there's a supportive crust with about this much soft snow on it. Kind of feels like a groomer at a ski hill and it's super fun to ski. Um, and if you're really cognizant of the temperature and how much crust there is, it can be a really um, enjoyable and safe way to get out in the mountains for a, a while when the sun is bright um, and it's not super cold. Uh, so it's a really great time of year. Please come to the, the spring one. Like Alex said, there's some more information about spring conditions on avalanche.ca. Yeah, and that uh, spring, the next uh, webinar Drew is talking about is going to be on March uh, thirty, March thirty first. So at the very end of the month. Um, another question here from uh, Joyce Matthews, which uh, she asked about the danger that exists in, I guess, uh, you know, thick to thin places in the snowpack. Yeah, that's so. We we at Avalanche Canada. If you're reading the forecast, I'm sure you're seeing that kind of language all the time, right? This thick to thin notion um, and why and why is it dangerous? Um, specifically to the spring, I'll just talk to that for one second in a traverse kind of setting. The, the rocky thin areas, if the rocks are exposed, will absorb more heat, more sun, um, and they'll start melting the snow around them, creating a weak area. In general, the thick to thin conversation about why a thin area is potentially a trigger point is that if the snowpack has a bunch of layers in it and those layers are quite deep down, um, as you get to a thinner spot, the snowpack just shrinks together. So all of those layers get closer and closer together. And so as your bubble, the stress bubble you create as a, as a person walking on the snow impacts the snow, you have, a, you have a chance to impact 
really deep layers in the snow. And by impact, I mean just affect them in some way. So you can imagine a house of cards um, and you touch maybe the top one, maybe just the top ones fall down. But if you touch the bottom ones, there's a, there's a high, higher chance that the whole tower comes, comes crumbling down. So those thin areas can be, we'll talk about them in forecast potentially as like trigger points because you as the potential trigger could, could touch quite low in the snow without really realizing it potentially. And so those thin spots become, become trigger points to the lower instabilities. Well, thanks, Drew. Uh, we've got two more questions left and there's also okay. one comment I'll pass on. So first of all, uh, there's a comment from Ryan Smith, which I thought I'd just pass on to everybody in case people didn't see it, but uh, he just said, one thing to think about when planning your timeline the day is sharing the load. So that's ensuring not one person is carrying the bulk and will slow progress on a sense. So just want to thank Ryan for sharing that uh, with everybody here. Um, the next question we've got is from Victoria Merritt who asked, uh, or wrote, decision-making should be collaborative, but I've been given the advice that it's a good idea to have a trip leader. What are your thoughts on that in the context of a traverse? Yeah, um, there's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, I think whether there's an assigned trip leader or not um, may not be the breaking point of uh, like a, a good or bad idea. Um, it may come down to group dynamics. If you feel in your group that there is a person who is showing some like strong leadership um, leading up to the trip, um, that people have confidence in their ability to intake the observations of the group and make a decision that people are happy with, that can be really awesome. I've had it go both ways and I've had really collaborative where there's no one really in charge kind of trips um, and all kind of have their pros and cons. A trip leader, I would say, has most function before the trip. So leading up to it, it's the person that's making sure the person who is organizing the food organized the food and did a good job. Um, and then is also making sure that um, the person who's organizing the helicopter flight did a good job too, and it's all going to happen. I think in the logistics leading up, a trip leader would probably be my recommendation, personal one. Um, but on trip, I would say collaborative decision making will likely and more consistently make good, safe decisions. So that's the way I would lean in my experience. <laughs> All right, thanks, Drew. Uh, there's one more question before I ask it. I just want to remind everybody here that we are giving away three discount codes to Outdoor Research's online store. So uh, don't hang up right after Drew answers this question because I'll be giving away those. So I'll be announcing the winners right after. So, uh, but here the last question comes from John Sargentson. Uh, he wants to know what is your most memorable traverse? Uh, um, that's a, um, thank you for the question. Um, I, um, my, I, I was super lucky to get to do a traverse um, in the Arctic Cordillera. So we skied a loop um, out of a, a hamlet on Baffin Island called Clyde River. And we skied to Samford Fjord, um, which is a famous um, area with gigantic, like big granite walls. Um, and we skied a loop um, out to Samford Fjord over the glaciers inland and then back to the fjord south of town um, and, then, and then back into town. It was about 23 days and I got to do it with my partner and our dog and it was the best. Awesome, sounds wonderful. <laughs> great, well, thanks so much, Drew. Uh, yeah. Great presentation and uh, imagine a few people are gonna be heading out here uh, looking at where to go uh, come awesome. spring. Yeah, anyways, as I mentioned, we've got three discount codes for outdoor research to give away. If you hear your name called as a prize winner, you send an email to producer at avalanche.ca to claim it. So uh, I'm just going to make sure I've got some names selected uh, from a bit earlier. So I just want to make sure everybody that I selected is actually still, still here. Um, that is the one qualification to win. So let me just open up the participant list again. There it is. All right, our 
first first code goes to Troy Mostawi. Uh, so congratulations, Troy. Uh, you've won a discount code for outdoor research. Our second one goes to Rebecca Hornung. And then the third one is to, just making sure they're still here, is to Claude Cosette. So congratulations, Troy, Rebecca, and Claude. As I mentioned, send an email to producer at avalanche.ca to claim your outdoor research discount code. All right, thanks a lot. I'll pass it over to Sarah to wrap things up. Thanks so much. That was so wonderful. Um, I think I, everyone learned a whole heap there. Um, so now we've gone through and we've got all the prizes handed out and everything else. Just want to tie everything up and thank you all for coming this evening. Thank you for your interest uh, in avalanche safety. Just a reminder that uh, Avalanche Canada is reliant on donations and if you are in a position where you can donate and you'd like to do so uh, you can use the link that's in the chat box to throw some money our way so thank you if you're able to do that next week's webinar uh, will be on march 10th it's going to be the daily mindset and that's going to cover uh a, be a panel of pro riders and it's going to cover all of their daily mindset prior to them going out on each outing. So you can find out what kind of questions they ask themselves, how they weigh various factors, and what they do to make sure that they have a good and safe time. Once again, uh, thank you so much for coming this evening. We appreciate your interest in avalanche safety and hope you all have a lovely evening. Thank you. <laughs>